welcome to a special episode of The Platform with Andrea Simmons. Her story, uh, what she's doing now is absolutely inspiring, but her backstory in some ways is a cautionary tale. Uh, the tragic effects of drugs in Australia at the moment, particularly ice. Uh, it's something that can affect anybody, and here's a couple of examples of that. Well, my name's Bethany, I'm 23 years old. Um, I abused ice for two years. Um, one of the really big things that affected my life when I was using um, was the picking. I would get fixated on my face just for hours on end. Um, you know, I'd find one imperfection and I just couldn't stop. I'd be in front of the mirror for hours just picking and picking. And during my time of addiction, I worked in the sex industry. Um, I used to smoke $400 a day, roughly. Um, sometimes that'd be twice a day I'd have to go pick up. I'd pick up again. I'd smoke again, I'd work again. It'd go on for days and days. And eventually, you know, I'd fall asleep or I couldn't get on and I'd fall asleep. Um, and I'd wake up and I'd do the whole thing all over again. Um, my name's Josh and um, I used to take uh, ice and um, I first started off on speed when I was 14 and um, it quickly become um, a major ice habit. Um, when I used I felt um, invincible and stuff like that and it made me not feel alone at first but then it quickly turned to um, a real desperate place where I was um, really hurting all the time and the using of ice become that bad that um, I had to do crime to support my habit and uh, I remember a time when I um, when I used ice I um, my grandma had died but I thought she was still alive and hiding from me um, and that was a really upsetting place to be in, um, feeling that alone, feeling like someone was not there for me, um, even though they were dead. Um, that's the extremity that ice um, made my brain think that um, things were happening when it wasn't. Um, Yeah, so there you go. It's tragic to see what it's doing to the youth of our country and people all around the world. And uh, like I said, Andrea, her story is incredible. But before we get into the chat, uh, here's some footage of her speaking nationally on the Today Show. I guess uh, 40 Good morning, is, Karen. It's not the sort of time of life that we start thinking about people taking ice. <laughs> no, I guess not. Um, no ages, really, is it? Well, w why did you? I guess, you know, at a weak moment in the wrong place at the wrong time and, you know, just um, I was offered it and, you know, somebody that I, uh, you know, cared for and wanted to be with and it was a bit of peer pressure and a weak moment, you know, and I, I, I'd never taken drugs before and, you know, I never imagined, I, I used to think, why do people do that? That's just so stupid, you know, um, but yeah, it happened to me and I got caught in that trap. But after that first experience, how long before you tried ice again and, and how soon was it that you, you came to need it? Well, after uh, about two weeks after the first time I, I came back to the coast, so this was all in Melbourne and um, uh, two weeks later I was back in Melbourne, the, next, the very next week we did it again and, and then it became like every four, four or five days or so um, and I think, you know, Look, you don't have um, sense of time when you're on that drug mm -hmm. or um, or the outside world, as a matter of fact. So, you know, people ask me, how much did you spend or what did you do? And, you know, it's kind of like a big haze. Um, you don't have any, um, you know, any perception of consequence or um, anyone else in the world, really. So it was, it was months, you know, months later, you know, two months later, maybe I was using non-stop you know, um, three, four days on, three, four days crashed, you know, where, where you sleep and just your body gives up. Um, so it was doing that, you know, for a good two years. I, I lost, you know, I lost everything. I lost three homes, I lost 
everything I owned, all my money. I'm still in debt um, from it on credit cards and um, I lost my kids, relationships, um, contact with my friends. Um, I guess, but more impo importantly, I lost myself. You know, yeah. because you do you do things on this drug that you don't even believe that you could, you know. Um, and at that time, it just didn't seem there's no consequence, you know. So, um, yeah, you lose yourself. So by the time uh, depression hit and paranoia and I couldn't get out of that, um, the drug just wasn't hitting it anymore. I, I, you know, the drug dealer said, oh, I amp it up with a bit of G and, you know, I almost lost my life because it, I, was, I took more than what my body weight allowed. I had lost so much weight, I was 41 kilos. Um, and I almost, I went in, I stopped breathing. Um, but that didn't stop me from the ice. I, I needed the ice to get up, you know, I needed that to get my head off the pillow and to function, my body hurt without it. I couldn't think straight. So, um, yeah, it was not a very good experience. It's a full-on story and it was great to uh, connect again and for her to jump on Skype. She's on the Gold Coast and uh, here she is, Andrea Simmons. Well, Andrea, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? <laughs> it's nice to see you again. Likewise. So, look, we've just seen some of the footage of you on like the Today Show and, and uh, you know, national spotlight on an issue that's worldwide um it's a powerful story you know so I, I mean if i can touch a bit more on your journey with it though like at what point did you know that this was like a, a massive problem for you andy i guess um when i i was first introduced to ice about eight years ago i didn't know what it was um, i i wasn't a drug user um, and I embarked on a journey um, by accepting a pipe once that I just thought was innocent and everybody tries to smoke something and no one's ever died from it, you know. Um, and I went down a really dark place for two years. I was entrapped in ice world, as I call it, um, and it was a horrific place. And, you know, I came near death's edge and it wasn't till you know, I started to come into recovery. I had, I had a supernatural occurrence that happened with me that took me out of where I was and, and brought me back home um, to Queensland and um, I was able to be surrounded by family that helped me into recovery and um, it wasn't in, until I was asked to go and talk at a school and I realised that these children had no idea what ice was and what it was actually made of and what it was doing uh, and the long-term effects associated with that. Um, you know, I still have kidney and heart issues and um, in and out of hospital and they don't want that for their life. So ARC was birthed out of my own adversary, adversary as you call it. Um, but, it, you know, in order to warn the next generation and the youth about these you know, ice is one of the drugs um, that's spearheading uh, nationwide and is really destroying communities out throughout Australia and, and, and internationally as well. So we've got to do something different, Andy. You know, um, what we're doing in the clinical side of things and the policing side of things, it's all fantastic, but we need to do something more and we need to engage with the community and the community need to have awareness and some sort of education on how it can help their peers around them um, in relation to this problem. What is it about that drug in particular that makes it so powerful? Like what, I've never taken it, right? I know, I think there's probably so many people out there that know someone that's actually doing it now or had a problem with it and you, it's all horror stories. There's no great stories coming out of it. But what is, what, what, why is it so special for people? Like why do they do it? If you have a look at the um, National Task Force report, it'll tell you why ICE is different to any other drug. They put um, put a report together in 2015 through the government um, and it shows all the specific reasons why it is so difficult um, with, with ICE to actually you know, come, come against this problem. It's probably even worse than heroin epidemic that we had um, many years ago. Um, the problem with ICE is that it hijacks the frontal lobe of the brain. So in the front of our brain, we make logic, rational decisions, and that's the frontal lobe operating. Um, ice hijacks that. It freezes that. And the person then operates out of the animal brain, which is the midbrain. Um, and the animal brain only cares about the next five minutes of pleasure. 
and it'll do whatever it needs to do to get it. And even if that means hurting people they love, stealing, um, killing, you know, ending up in jail, you know, and, and that's why we're seeing the horrific consequences. And the come down of that is so intense, Andy, that, you know, the person that's using that is entrapped in a place with no dopamine being, being supplied in the brain, um, a depression. So when there's no dopamine, there's depression. The serotonin is depleted out of the brain, so anxiety, you know, the paranoia kicks in, the psychosis kicks in. It's a it's a time bomb waiting to happen, but see, people don't realise that when they just think it's just a party drug, you know. Um, we need to expose it for what it really is and what it's doing to people. Wow. So, you know, going back on your story then, I mean, you had a pretty successful business when you were younger. You were a mum. Life would have been pretty much normal in some ways. And then, uh, you know, you go to Melbourne, I think, and you had the hit down there with that friend. Like, yeah. how, did, how, how did it spoil you know, for you? Yes. What do we classify as normal? Like, I mean, I was a little bit out of the normal because, you know, at the age of 21, I'd, I'd made my first million dollars in traditional business. Um, you know, with my, I was married. I had two kids at, um, by the age of 21, you know, and um, had life at my fingertips. You know, life was really good. Um, sure, I went through a divorce and, you know, things got a bit rocky for a while, but that wasn't, um, you know, that what, what tipped it. For me, um, it was meeting somebody that bought out an ice pipe in an environment which was, you know, a three thousand um, dollar, you know, hotel suite with all the glitz and the glamour, and you know, it, it's a little glass pipe with some crystals in there. You know, it does. It's not like it doesn't look like a needle or or a tablet that you can't control. It's a little pipe of a thing, you know. And I I was forty, and I thought, hey, you know, this. I'm old enough to have a try of something. Everyone tries something sometimes and you just don't think it's going to happen to you and you just don't realise, you know. I came two years down the track, Andy, and I stopped breathing um, on on a concoction of – because once you start using ice and you're not actually being able to get uh, alleviate yourself from that um, that world of entrapment and anxiety and psychosis, you, you start to polyuse. To, to numb yourself because you can't get out of it. So I took something called G, I think in Queensland they call it fantasy. Um, I didn't ask any questions. Um, I couldn't process. I couldn't think. I just downed it and I stopped breathing. So it's extremely dangerous because it takes the person's capacity to think. Right. So that's the difference. Was that, was that the lowest moment? Because that's what I wanted to ask you, if you wouldn't mind sharing with me, like what – do you think, looking back, that was the scariest and hardest moment for you in this journey? Look, there were many, Andy. Um, somebody that's using ice for, um, you know, a day like that and is addicted and, um, and becomes entrapped very quickly, um, you'll go through many phases of wanting out, you know, and there's many low moments. So I, um, I remember a moment where I was lost around the corner from my house, but I didn't realise I was around the corner from my house, and I spent the whole day on the curb in, on the street side um, crying and thinking, how am I going to find my way home? Um, and it was, you know, what seems crazy is a reality um, for the person entrapped. You know, another time I was um, sent to a, it sent to my room, and I I thought I was in jail, and um, and I couldn't get out, and I was in like having a panic attack, and um, you know, just the psychosis, and um, I smoked three houses, my Mercedes, my life away. You know, just it was like air I needed to have it otherwise I couldn't function you know um I remember one day waking up and um my body hurt you know from top to bottom everything ached you know the the chemicals in this drug was eating away at my muscles um and your organs inside because it's made out of things like acetone and Drano you know and countertop cleaners and they even put glass in the mixture to fill it up and, you know, people don't realise that, you know, and I didn't know, you know, I didn't know, I was 40 and I didn't know. Imagine what our kids out there don't know. So there were many low points, but you can't get out, so you don't know. Because you can't operate, your frontal lobe can't operate, you don't know how to actually get out. So we're training people out in communities on how to help somebody that's entrapped in our world. And what does that help entail? Like, obviously, you say don't take it, but, I mean, these people are so addicted that that's probably going to be, you know, hard to enforce. But what do you say to people that, that want to get off it? Well, 
Yeah, um, we often get calls um, at ARC and, and on our show, Let's Talk About Ice, that we do weekly. Um, people call in and say, look, I've had enough, I want help. And it really takes um, an, a bit of understanding from peers and people around them to understand the cycle of addiction um, where people are at the right point to, you know, contemplation stage um, and somebody that's close to them can sit down and, and do a way up of the costs versus the benefits of them using and the cost versus the benefits of them cleaning up and have the right resources at hand when they say, yeah, I, I know this is killing me, this is destroying my life, I want help. So then knowing what to do next, so to have, you know, make a pathway into a detox or a rehab or a community rehab. Um, so it's engaging with the right information which we want to offer communities through forums and, um, you know, we have stuff online as well that they can learn from. Australia's fight against ICE has reached our schools. Dealers are now targeting kids as young as 12. But a radical new program run by former ICE addicts is trying to educate students about the ugly reality of life on the drug. I never thought I would be an ICE addict. Trainer is a base for ICE. You wouldn't eat this. I was dumbfounded of when I saw the ingredients of it. Never ceases to amaze me how many kids are actually affected by ice. We love our kids and we don't want our kids to fall into that trap. You don't want to try this, guys. You don't want to try this. This really needs to be in every school in Australia. It needs to be nationally. She's been clean now for five years. Part of the 2% of ice users who ever break free from the drug. And now she takes her life story on the road, travelling to schools across the country to warn of the dangers. You're going to get depression. You're going to get anxiety. You're going to get psychosis. It's a really, really scary journey, and I don't wish that upon my worst enemy. It's raw, it's confronting, but it could be life-changing for some of these kids. What you see before you, you might say, oh, she looks all right, she's tried ice. Let me tell you that my kidneys still bleed. Five years clean I've been. They break down some of the myths about ice, in particular, what's in it. Drano is a base for ice. You wouldn't eat this. Hydrochloric acid, used to make plastic removes rust, eats away human flesh. And all the while, barely a peep from the students. Equal parts shocked and entranced by Andrea explaining the difficult path to recovery. It wasn't easy, guys. It took about 18 months to be able to start thinking, being, you know, processing and enjoying life again. We saw some footage of you standing in front of the kids in a classroom talking about your uh, experiences and the look on the kids' faces is incredible. They're like totally into what you're saying because I'm sure even at that age, in their early teens, it's it's a scary thought. What does that feel like for you being up there and, and sharing your story doing that? Look, it's very emotional for me. Um, you know, I have to go back through the journey and um, and I have to, you know, relive it and feel it. And, and, you know, it does, it hurts, um, but it's, I, I feel like it's necessary. I wish I was told. You know, I wouldn't have to be in and out of hospital now. I wouldn't have had to go through all the pain. And, you know, it takes about 12 to 18 months for for the person that's been using us to actually um, have their have their thought process back to be able to operate and function normally, and I'm still, um, you know, I still have gaps of memory loss and uh, retention, you know, of memory. Um, it's not an easy journey, and I've been six years in recovery, um, so it breaks down the neurological pathways inside the brain. So you have to recreate new neurological pathways, and that takes time and years and a lot of dedication to do that through learning new things, music, um, you know, through reading and um, trying to retain memory, you know, and use supplements sometimes, natural supplements to help, um, like krill oil. And um, so, yeah, it's, so, so it's, it's a difficult journey, but it has to be done. Um, I think that the kids, we owe our community you know, we owe our community um, to protect them from, to protect our next generation and really warn them, this is what's going to happen.
you know, we're speaking truth in love yeah. and we're talking from experience. What, I mean, this drug seems to be cheap, right, compared to the things that people go, I mean, is it, how, what is, why is it cheap? Why is it, is that how they sell it because they can make it cheap and they get it out there? Yeah, uh, look, most of the chemicals in our you can buy in a hardware store. Um, it's really cheap. They, they fill it with glass, like I said, and, um, you know, the synthetic side of uh, pseudoephedrine is being imported um, through China uh, in bulk and um, very synthetically made and it's very cheap. And so that's why, you know, that people go out in the town, they don't realise, you know, and the dealers are giving them out as um, sample packs and going, you know, yeah, just try this, you know, and giving it for free to girls and then before that you know it, they're using them for prostitution and trafficking and, you know, getting these guys to traffic the stuff. They haven't got their brain to use, Andy, you know. Absolutely tragic. Hey, why do you, why do you reckon it is that, like, in society we just don't, like, staying normal in general like we either need alcohol or smoking some weed or people are doing ice i mean it's kind of weird right that we just that normality is kind of like just a scary place to be yeah i think that um personally that i guess it's personal opinion then from everybody um my personal opinion on that is that we've lost um We've lost a lack of love in community. Um, I believe that if you, uh, you know, treat treat your neighbour like you would yourself, and if we all engage in that process, the world will be a much different place. And I think, you know, back if you go back in centuries ago, we had culture, we had, you know, um, tribes, we had community, we had churches, we had, you know, real um, networks of people that looked out for one another and, um, you know, taught the next generation. And um, we've lost that. Um, so we've lost that respect and um, and that love, and I think that that starts to break down and show in many areas. So, um, you know, people, uh, we operate in humanity from two places, from either love or fear. And we've just got to go, well, what is this? You know, um, we're not operating out of love when we're, you know, abusing substance and, and you know, the, the whole world's in on this, on this particular, um, you know, a journey. Um, so we've got to go back to what is it that we're lacking and, you know, let's get real. I hope that what you're doing, which is incredible, I mean, is the government really supporting you? I mean, tell us about the company you started and the things you've been doing. Yeah. Um, AARC is a charity. It's a non-for-profit charity. Um, and it's now we're running offices um, or groups nationally. So we have um, teams in Adelaide, in Melbourne, in Sydney, in Cairns, um, WA, uh, Central Queensland, um, and yeah, it's it's self-funded. It's not. Um, we, we rely on the community support. Uh, we we charge a small fee to go out and you know into community places um, to I guess to get us there and to to work get the petrol in the car and to get the presenters there. Um, but it's totally. We've got 104 volunteers at the moment, and uh, through only two staff. Are uh, paid very minimal wage. Um, we're not funded by the government. We have continuously put submissions forward to government. Um, they. I thought, based... one the, I thought one of the government's big thing is supposed to be protecting and nurturing the youth of our country. So I can't understand why this wouldn't be a massive thing that they should support. Um, what happened initially, Andy, and, and I'll, I'll go. I'll go into that a little bit. Um, you know, the government appoint um, leaders in drug and alcohol and um, basically they've um, made a statement that um, ex-addicts in schools don't work and that, that does more harm than good. And we've found that different over the last five years and all the schools that we've engaged in and communities, they just love what we're doing and they want more of us. We're now working in prisons, in youth justice, in schools, um, you know, in various avenues. And... Uh, yet they're not seeing the results of that and um, and funding it. So, you know, we're doing the work that we can do with limited resources, um, but we have to rely on the community support. So we're talking to, you know, corp corporate companies, we're talking to mines, we're talking to rotaries, um, lions clubs, and saying, look, can you sponsor that school? They want us to come in. And that's how we're continuing to do uh, week to week. Wow, that's inspiring stuff. So, I mean, like I said before, if someone out there knows someone is doing ice or they're doing them themselves and they start to get that feeling of like, I've got to stop this, how do they find you and, and read up about the information and watch your show? 
Absolutely. Um, they can connect with us on our website at www.australianantiicecampaign.org.au um, or they can call us, and I'm going to plug our new number for, for you guys out there, uh, 1-800-NO-2-ICE, yeah? N-O, number two, ICE. So that's our new phone number, um, and that will give you um, – that they'll come through to the care team who will assess the call and um, then connect them to the relevant state and um, to the service that they need. So we have – we do family support. We do peer support, um, so people that are in addiction that want – to get out and we have people like myself who've been through it and we take other people beside us and we help them be their brain while they can't. Um, and so we also do education and awareness in schools and workplaces and uh, communities. Very, very cool. What's like the, the, the biggest thing you've learnt so far in your journey looking back? I think um, you just don't give up on people. And um, if you speak truth in love, love always prevails. It always wins, no matter what. You know, if you are talking to somebody in addiction, if you speak your heart um, and you, you, you know, you're, you're solid on that, um, it, it gets through and you just don't give up on them, you know. Very cool to talk to you. Thank you for your time and I uh, wish you all the best with it all. Thanks so much, Andy. I look forward to seeing you soon. So there you go. Great to catch up with Andrea. And uh, if you know anybody out there or even yourself, uh, if you have a problem, then of course jump on their website and even contact Andrea and see if they can help you because, um, man, it's just a tragedy. But uh, look, thanks for watching. Uh, love doing shows about people and uh, we'll see you next time on the platform.